Good evening. Welcome. I'm Alicia Zymet, the Public Programs Manager at the Newberry. All of you here in the room and those tuning in on the live stream, thank you for joining us for this evening's program, Harriet Monroe and the Open Door. Let me ask everyone to please silence your phones and devices at this time. If you are new to the Newberry, the library supports and inspires research, teaching, and learning in the humanities. Since our founding in 1887, the Newberry has remained dedicated to deepening our collective understanding of ourselves and the world around us. We connect researchers and visitors with our collection in our reading rooms, exhibition galleries, program spaces, classrooms, and online digital resources. Our reading rooms and exhibition galleries are open to readers at no charge, with no appointment necessary, Tuesday through Saturday. Our exhibition galleries will be open until 7.30 this evening, so if you'd like, please plan to visit after the program. The current exhibition is Seeing Race Before Race. Programs like this one are free and open to the public thanks to the generosity of our community of donors. To support our work, consider making a gift to the Newberry. Tonight's event will conclude with a Q&A. Please text your questions for the speaker to 833 899-3399 at any time during the conversation this evening. And we will have this number up throughout the program. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Eric Shoemaker of the Poetry Foundation. Thanks, Alicia, and hi, everybody. My name is Eric Shoemaker. I'm the Digital Archive Editor at the Poetry Foundation, and I'm a co-curator of the exhibition Harriet Monroe and the Open Door, after which a talk is named. I'm honored and excited to be introducing Liesl Olson, who served as a consultant on the exhibition for tonight's talk. Harriet Monroe and the Open Door maps the life and work of founding editor of Poetry Magazine, Harriet Monroe. Monroe's establishment of the open door policy, which advocated openness without allegiance to any single class or school, led to the publication of poets including T.S. Eliot, Sarah Teasdale, Carl Sandburg, and Robert Frost, among many others. Monroe's vision continues to be the magazine's mission. The exhibition focuses on the 1893 Chicago World's Fair and Monroe's involvement as a commissioned artist, as well as the beginning of Poetry Magazine in 1912. Artifacts include excerpts from a World's Fair scrapbook and The Red Man's Rebuke by Simon Pokagan from here at the Newberry. Artifacts from the University of Chicago's Poetry Magazine and Monroe collections, and rarely and never before seen artifacts from the Poetry Foundation's collection of Monroe materials. I'd like to thank our contributing writers and exhibition team, including Liesl, for their insightful, playful, and critical contributions, as well as their generous and mindful collaboration, which was central to the exhibition structure, in shaping this important and first of its kind for the Poetry Foundation exhibition. I'd also like to thank Mark Polod, who is here, who's a contributing writer for an extension of the exhibition about Harriet Monroe's art criticism, and that will be published this fall. I'd like to thank our generous collaborators here at the Newberry for putting this talk together, especially Sarah, Karen, and Alicia, for your advice and participation at important stages of the project and for putting this all together. As a party favor for this talk, make sure you stop by the table over here um, and take home a copy of the comic book, The Amazing Harriet Monroe. This was designed and illustrated by New Yorker illustrator and animation artist, Lily Carre and tells the story of Harriet Monroe in miniature. And visit us at the exhibit before January for the full story. A few of our free events for the fall, I'll list for you. The first public reading of the 2023 Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Fellows is this Saturday at the building. Refuturing the verse, Poetry Threads of Native Chicago is at the Center for Native Futures on October 22nd and Deja Vu, an a reading in homage to the legendary black gay poet Asado Saint is on November 2nd. And now I'll introduce Liesl. Liesl Olson is a writer, cultural historian, literary scholar, and social justice advocate. She's the author of works including Chicago Renaissance, Literature and Art in the Midwest Metropolis, which won the 2018 Pegasus Award for Poetry Criticism from the Poetry Foundation, 
and traces the development of Chicago as a cultural hub from the 1893 World's Fair on. Liesl is the director of the Jane Addams Hull House Museum. Before Hull House, she directed the program in Chicago Studies at the Newberry Library here, where in 2021, she curated Chicago Avant-Garde, Five Women Ahead of Their Time. According to Liesl, she holds strong opinions about poetry, which we hopefully will hear some of tonight, and despite her proclivity for impossible shoes, loves to go camping. Please welcome our friend and collaborator, the brilliant Liesl Olson. Thank you, Eric. I'm going to give you another slide, which sort of says the same thing with a different image. It's such a pleasure to be here at the Newberry, where I was on staff for eight years, um, and to uh, be part of this program in collaboration with the Poetry Foundation, which of course publishes Poetry Magazine. Um, many of you may know that the magazine was actually located here at the Newberry for many years. And so these institutions have very um, beautiful and overlapping histories. Um, there's a lot of shared sort of staff connections among the two institutions. Um, a lot of the readings for the magazine actually took place here in Ruggles Hall. Um, so it's just a kind of really lovely culmination in some ways too of this, um, of this exhibition that Eric is so beautifully curated. Um, definitely go down the street and take a look. As I told Eric, it's just a series of revelations, um, really expertly and beautifully put together. I learned a lot, and I've been thinking and writing about Harriet Monroe for about 10 years, and the exhibition really did um, sort of, you know, leave me wide-eyed, so it's great. It's really great. I want to give a shout-out to my fellow curators. Um, it was such a great team of people, really, to work with. Um, Mira Algaraja, Zeta Ballou, Missy Bradshaw, who's here, Catherine Litwin, Ch Chiku Reddy, Fred Sasaki, and Kelly Wisecup. It's not easy to work with eight consultants and um, get all of their voices and perspectives into an exhibition. Um, and it's a real tribute to Eric that he's done it really seamlessly and beautifully. So when Eric invited me to um, contribute to the exhibition, my first thought was, um, what can we learn now at this moment in time from a singular life? And specifically from the life of Harriet Monroe. What is a woman like Harriet Monroe, born in 1860, growing up in a city that itself was growing up? Um, an upper middle class woman with fierce ambitions and intense sensibilities, a woman given every privilege, despite, of course, the conundrum of actually being a woman, um, a writer and an editor who fundamentally transformed her country's relationship to modern art and modern poetry. What might we learn from her life, her history, the forces that shaped her, and what might resonate with us at this moment today? I think the exhibition really does ask these questions. Um, and they, they, the exhibition asks them very clearly, what does she have to do with the present moment? And it brings Monroe into the present moment. Um, I want to start with these two images of Monroe to show you how the exhibition transforms Monroe for the present. One way that happens is visually through the work of the artist that Eric mentioned, Lily Carre, who composed a wonderful graphic feature about Monroe's life. Here we see a young Harriet Monroe in profile, wearing a Victorian dress with these enormous puffed sleeves, and Lily Carre's elegant transformation of that look into a geometry of red and black with a pegasus or a winged horse as the symbol of poetic inspiration, in the right corner, and of course, that's the symbol of the magazine of the foundation. I have lots of tote bags with the Pegasus on them. It's been transformed over time um, in different um, designers' kind of renditions. So as a figure of the past and a figure of the present, uh, Monroe is a woman who is both known and unknown. Her significance for literary scholars has been, of course, that she launched Poetry Magazine in 1912 which was the most important magazine of the movement known as modernism, which was a radical explosion of voices and styles, a real a sort of 
aesthetic response to transformative shifts in transportation, communication, um, production, technology. Modernism was an art of cities, a, a global phenomenon expressed in places like Chicago, which during Monroe's lifetime was the fastest growing city in the world. Since those early decades of the 20th century, Monroe has appeared kind of quietly in literary histories um, as an editor who was perhaps not as loud or experimental or bohemian as the modernist poets whose work she championed and published. But she was no question a great risk taker in what she published and, and in the choices that she made in her own life. There's been no proper biography of Har Harriet Monroe, and I'm not going to write it. Um, so this is also <laughs> a call out to you online or in here in person to think about taking up this project. The best account of her life is her own in this book called A Poet's Life which um, was published in 1938, two years after she died. It was unfinished in her lifetime, so it was sort of um, forced into, into press um, in an unfinished way. Um, it's a deeply exasperating read, uh, I think, um, or at least it was for me, because how she sort of flattens out her life um, into one kind of evenly paced chronology despite the many incredible people and events and peak moments of her life. Um, there's really no spark to this autobiography. It's very earnest. Um, so that's what I have to say about it, which isn't to say you shouldn't take a look, but you know that's the style of it. Um, her life was actually really incredible. Um, so in thinking about, thinking about her life, certainly at this moment after a global pandemic, after the Me Too movement, after the racial reckonings of 2020, after a sea surge of interest in women's lives in their invisible labor and um, all kinds of invisible labors, unpaid and uh, more generally, I think a woman like Harriet Monroe is even more important, more resonant, and certainly more inspiring than she was to me when I first started writing about her. And this is because she's a person who changed her mind. She changed her mind about things. She evolved over time. She was not an intransigent thinker. Um, she was a woman of her times while also developing a consciousness of the times in which she lived. She was not afraid to say that she was wrong about things. And in particular, she rethought the narratives of manifest destiny and Western imperialism that defined Chicago during her lifetime, especially during the Chicago World's Fair. She was open to change. She was a pragmatist like John Dewey, who was a friend of hers. Um, and she became bolder, freer, and more herself as she aged. She launched her greatest experiment, Poetry Magazine, when she was 52 years old. And she realized at that time that her manifesto for the magazine, what she called the open door, which is part of the title of the exhibition, would be an ethics of heterogeneity, of welcoming many poetic styles and creeds. The magazine would never be associated with just one school of poetry. And this flexibility, this openness, is a, is a policy to which the magazine still subscribes today. Now, as an editor of uh, poetry, Monroe corresponded with so many incredible um, poets of the 20th century, as well as some really minor and forgotten ones, too. And she kept really excellent records. All of these records are down at the University of Chicago alongside her personal collection. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is that um, she was certainly not alone in starting a modernist little magazine, um, a term that describes a periodical with a really kind of small circulation, maybe 2,000 subscribers. Um, usually these magazines were short-lived. Uh, they were ephemeral. They were affiliated with maybe one or two editors, or they were affiliated with their particular politics or a particular style. There were dozens and dozens of other modernist magazines, not unlike poetry. You know, it's kind of like starting a blog or starting a podcast today. I mean, really, truly, everybody in the literary world was doing it. Um, but this is what made poetry different. Unlike other magazines that ran for just a few months or a few years, Monroe never missed an issue. She published every single month. The, 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 the magazine has not missed a month since, since 1912. 
Um, and also, unlike other magazines, she paid her poets. She paid all of the contributors. Paying them was incredibly important to her. Valuing that intellectual labor was incredibly important to her, although she never paid herself. Um, those, that, those two things really set it apart. Um, and she had an incredible editorial eye. Um, she set it apart as editor. She, um, she published uh, poems, really canonical po poems, such as T.S. Eliot's Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, you know, Let Us Go Then, You and I, as a evening spreads out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table, right? Like she was sort of chilled by those lines. Um, she sat on them for a while, and then she published the poem. She published one of my very favorite poems, um, Wallace Stevens' Sunday Morning, before anybody knew who Wallace Stevens was. She published the most iconic poem about Chicago, Carl Sandburg's Chicago, when he was still an obscure newspaper reporter writing for the socialist press. I mean, she, she pulled that out and published it out of a stack of submissions. She published HDs, Hermes of the Ways. And she published Ezra Pound's Early Cantos, important work by Robert Frost, Langston Hughes, Ravindranath Tagore, William Carlos Williams, W.B. Yeats, and numerous, numerous others. Very few of these poets were well known at the time. Now, for literary scholars, you know, most have a rough sense of this, of, of this is why Monroe was important. But what I was really thrilled to find in her archives is the material history of how the poems evolved, how she edited them, and how they first appeared in the magazine. Um, you know, it was also really extraordinary to discover how she built this extraordinary, this just network of women around her in, in the offices of the magazine. Um, it really was a very female-centric space. Um, you know, there were five or six staffers roughly at all time, and most of them were women. I'm just going to show you images of two of the most important women of the magazine. On the left, I can see the reflections, and I can just look forward out of those windows, um, is Alice Corbin Henderson, who started, you know, right when the magazine launched as the assistant or associate editor. So she was there for the first 10 years of the magazine. She moved to Santa Fe in 1916. She suffered from tuberculosis, so she wanted to be in better weather. Um, and she was associated with the circle of artists and writers around Mabel Dodge Luhan. She published, um, and, or she really sort of advocated Mon for Monroe to publish the work of um, D.H. Lawrence. Um, she befriended Lawrence as well as Willa Cather. She was often the first reader of submissions, and she was a really, really important interlocutor for Monroe. And then on, on the right is Eunice Teachens. Her papers are actually here at the Newberry. It's an extraordinary research, a resource. Um, she worked at the magazine through the early 1930s. She was herself a poet and a journalist. You see her here in um, kind of military garb. She, she um, served as a war correspondent during the First World War in France. Um, and she, she wrote for the Chicago Daily News. Now, Tijans adored Monroe. A lot of these women did. Um, she thought of Monroe as a kind of mother figure. Um, and, uh, you, you know, there was another staff member, I'll just quote a letter from her named Jessica Nelson North, a bit younger, who at one point went on leave. She had her first baby. And she writes back to Monroe in 1919, I hear you have imported a man exclamation mark. <laughs> Mr. Fuller tells me it is quite without precedent. Um, yeah, there were very few men there, and I actually don't know who she's referring to. Mr. Fuller was Henry Blake Fuller, the Chicago novelist um, who served as the magazine's proofreader. Um, and then in 1923, while Monroe was traveling through Europe, um, Eunice Teachens took over running the magazine and kept writing to Monroe and giving her updates. Um, and uh, a few women in the office were pregnant at the time, and she wrote to Monroe, um, giving her the update. She said, all of the staff and unborn babes are well. Marion, Susan, and Mila. Jessica's baby is born and a son. I never knew so fecund an atmosphere. Um, so it was this incredibly interesting, rich female space. Um, uh, these women were all roughly, you know, they were all younger than Monroe. Um, Teachings called her Lady Harriet, and the name kind of stuck among them all. Very unusual office environment. The offices were first located in the Fine Arts Building, and that was very brief. And then um, she moved them to a kind of dilapidated mansion on um, Cass Street, which is now South Wabash Avenue. 
they had a couple rooms um, in this in this old home. Um, so it was actually a kind of domestic sphere as well, um, which may remind you of somebody else in Chicago doing something similar, who I'll, and who I'll get to. Um, so so the question is, you know, how did she do this? How did she get here? How did she get to running this magazine, creating this really unusual work env environment? Right. Um, what were the forces um, that shaped her thinking? Um, and uh, who else was doing it? Well, yes, of course, just across the street, there was somebody else um, in an old home surrounded by women. Uh, she did have some peers, right? Namely, Jane Addams, um, who, uh, you know, founded Hull House on the Near West Side at the nexus of many, many different immigrant communities in Chicago. Um, it became the country's most influential social settlement. It's obviously where I now work. Um, she committed herself, along with Ellen Gates Starr and their housekeeper, Mary Kaiser, to really serving the urban poor, um, uh, living um, with them, right? Um, now, like Jane Addams, Monroe was one of the first generation of college women to attend, sorry, one of the first generation of women to attend college. And yet these women were barred from entering really many professional fields. Nobody would hire them. And like Adams, who was really her exact contemporary, Monroe was, um, Monroe was really her father's daughter. Uh, before the founding of, of Poetry Magazine, she would have been known as the daughter of Henry Stanton Monroe, a well-known lawyer who had come to Chicago in the early 1850s. After the Great Fire of 1871, Monroe's father built a library of black walnut bookcases in the family's home on Michigan Avenue and 22nd Street. Monroe's education really began in her father's library, as did Jane Addams's education. And then Monroe went off to Washington, D.C. to attend the Visitation Convent for two years. Um, here we see both women, Jane Addams and, and Harriet Monroe, in the 1890s. It was an era, in the words of Jane Addams, when women lived within the constrictions of the family claim. That was Addams's phrase. They were bound by the obligations of domestic life. They were beholden to the permissions of their fathers and husbands. And they lived under the assumption that their life's work should be the care of elders and children. Now, of course, neither Adams or Monroe lived this way. They valued and upheld care work. That's what we th I think we call it today, the labor really associated with women, even as they chose not to marry. And of course, neither had children. They were of their times while also being complete radicals. And their paths would overlap in important ways in Chicago. They shared many passions, and they were powerfully committed to improving the lives of other people. For, Mon for Monroe, that meant improving their lives through poetry. Now, this photograph of Monroe was taken just a few years after the Chicago World's Fair. She's posing on this pillowed chair in her home at 56 Astor Street, just really a few blocks away. Um, an address um, at which she lived with really extended uh, family members. Um, these included her older sister, Dora Louise, who married the architect John Wellborn Root, who of course was Daniel Burnham's business partner in designing the World's Fair. Root died young and early um, uh, before the, sort of his plans for the fair were realized. But his ideas about architecture had a really powerful influence on Monroe. In fact, all of her metaphors about what Poetry Magazine was in terms of its radicalness, all of her metaphors are architectural. She venerated Root. She wrote his biography eventually. Now, um, unquestionably, the most important event in Harriet Monroe's young life was the Chicago World's Fair, for which she wrote a long poem called The Columbian Ode. Here we see on the cover the figure of Columbia, uh, a feminine personification of the Americas. Um, now, keep in mind, the fair was really commemorating the 400th anniversary of Columbus's arrival in the New World. Um, now, Monroe did not question the narratives of a heroic Columbus, of westward expansion, of white supremacy. She absorbed these, these narratives. And after years of struggling as a writer, she believed that the fair was really her opportunity to make a mark, to write something that would express the collective optimism of the fair. She wrote over 2,000 lines of verse for her Columbian Ode. Um, I thought I'd just spend the rest of the evening reading them. Yeah. No, no, I won't do it. I'll just show you the opening stanza, um, and you'll get a sense of things. Columbia, 
On thy brow are dewy flowers, plucked from wide prairies and from mighty hills. Lo, toward this day have led the steadfast hours. Now to thy hope the world its beaker fills. The old earth hears a song of blessed themes and lifts her head from a deep couch of dreams. Her queenly nations, elder born of time, troop from high thrones to hear. Clasp thy strong hands, tread with thee path sublime, lovingly bend the ear. You heard the sirens, that's what we're hearing, right? As we bend our ear. Um, yes, lots of exclamations. Columbia, she starts, right? There's a kind of invocation of the muse, which here is the new world. Um, you know, the new world is the muse uh, to the old, the old earth or old Europe, which will be invigorated with the new song of the Americas. Um, you know, it's an extremely problematic notion of the Americas, of course, in which Native Americans are either tamed or completely absent, as we learn as we read the poem. Um, in her autobiography, uh, Monroe explained that the figure of Columbia in her poem moved through vast virgin spaces toward the splendors and triumphs of modern civilization and an era of universal peace. But she also explained um, that she could no longer believe in this idea of universal peace that would somehow emerge from the settlement of the Americas. And this is a point that um, our co-curators Zeta Bellow and Kelly Wisecup make, and they're really excellent, excellent essay uh, for the exhibition, which is online. They explain how Monroe looked back on the ode as she was writing her autobiography in the 1930s, now having traveled the world, now having witnessed global conf conflict as well as the First World War. And she, she describes her ode as smeared with dark ironies. And that's actually the title of the essay. <clears throat> Now, this is the building in which um, the poem was actually performed, um, both performed to music, sung aloud by a chorus of 5,000 people, and then parts of it were actually recited um, by a New York City elocutionist. Um, and this was all done before the fair actually opened. It was like a year before the fair opened. It was a big kind of publicity event um, in the Manufacturers and Liberal Arts Building. That's what you see here was the first building that went up. Um, it tripled uh, the size of St. Peter's in Rome. It was the largest covered building in the world at the time. It's quite a statement. Um, so, you know, politicians, world leaders, the Supreme Court justices, the vice president, you know, they all came for these openings, these dedicatory ceremonies that were like marking the fair and really saying, come next year to the fair. This is the inside of the building. <clears throat> it's massive. Um, now, just think about how do you project the ode in a space like this without things like microphones, right? Um, it was very echoey. Um, uh, it was sort of a mess. Um, you know, Monroe describes it in her autobiography. You're like, wait, what? Wait, there was another band playing somewhere else. And, um, you know, there was music. I mean, it just didn't actually work. Um, there was just a lot of um, sort of welter of sound. Um, but maybe that's appropriate for a poem like The Ode. Uh, because amidst this spectacle, there were certainly other voices that were critiquing the, the fair's discourses of, of white supremacy, and Simon Pokagan was one of them. <clears throat> he was one of these voices. He was a Potawatomi leader who published on durable pages of birch bark his book, The Red Man's Greeting. It was also printed with the title, The Red Man's Rebuke. And this is what he wrote, part of what he wrote. I'll just quote. He writes, in behalf of my people, the American Indians, I hereby declare to you the pale-faced race that has usurped our lands and homes, that we have no spirit to celebrate with you the great Columbian Fair now being held in this Chicago city, the wonder of the world. So Pekagan was a pretty visible leader, um, and he was an, actually had been invited to speak at the fair, and he used his platform to really fundamentally challenge the celebration of Columbus. <clears throat> Another really important voice of dissent was the extraordinary Ida B. Wells, a journalist, a suffragist, eventually a friend of Jane Addams, 
who came to the fair and distributed her pamphlet written with abolitionist Frederick Douglass, The Reason Why the Colored American is Not in the World's Columbian Exposition. She described the pamphlet as a clear, plain statement of facts concerning the oppression put upon the colored people in this land of the free and the home of the brave. And I think today it's really voices like Pokagon and Wells that seem so important to remember, to remind us that critique and dissent are crucial to American democracy. You know, as for Monroe's poem, nobody really read it then or now. Um, uh, here it is on the left in its special souvenir edition. Um, but so few of these souvenir editions actually sold at the fair that in her autobiography, she, just, she describes the really cold winter following the fair in which she had a stack of her, these souvenir editions and she put them in her tiny stove to keep warm. Um, who knows, there seemed to still be a lot floating around on aid books, you know, they're not so hard to find, but that is the story she tells. Um, but it did give her the sense that she could do really big things. Um, and in this respect, it's a really important precursor to Poetry Magazine. As you can see, they look really similar. They were both designed by Chicago and Will Bradley in this kind of arts and crafts style, which was pretty modern at the time. Um, you know, the ode, the most important thing about the ode also was that it was at the center of a really important copyright case. So a New York City newspaper had come to the dedicatory ceremonies, had gotten their hands on some version of the ode, and had actually published it in, in their newspaper without Monroe's permission. Um, Monroe was totally furious. And with the help of her father, a lawyer, she sued the world for copyright infringement. And surprisingly, she won. Um, this is in the exhibition. It's a telegram from the editor of the New York World to his field correspondent, a journalist named Fay. The editor tells him to get a good talk with her and convince Monroe that it's so much better to have the world feature the poem rather than have it peddled, peddled around among the little papers. Um, now, there's some real patronizing going on here, as if a publication in New York City, you should be so thrilled, you know, to have your poem appear rather than in any place in the Midwest. Um, but Monroe didn't want it peddled around anywhere, certainly not without a, her permission and definitely not without payment. So her lawsuit was a real victory. She um, was awarded $5,000, um, which she eventually used for a grand tour of Europe. Um, and this trip was a real revelation to her. Um, she visited the gardens and cathedrals of England, of Italy, of France. And she realized in a panic that America did not have um, the old models of European patronage to support the arts. And it was this trip that made her think, who will ever support poetry? Like, how are we going to do this in Chicago? How will it flourish without financial support? She came back to Chicago. She looked around. Um, the World's Fair buildings, of course, had born to, uh, burned to the ground. Chicago was looking something like this. Um, here is an image of a massive traffic jam on Dearborn Street. You can see the lumber, the streetcars, the horses, the people. How is the city of Chicago, which was so defined by its industrial and commercial ambitions, a city that was the fastest growing city in the world, how was it ever going to commit itself to fostering the arts? So the next 10 years were really rocky for Harriet Monroe. Um, she couldn't get hired by any of the newspapers or magazines. Um, she had a nervous breakdown. Um, nobody would put her on staff anywhere. Um, she really didn't, um, she really struggled. Um, for, for a moment, she lived at Hull House, um, where she found meaning in living with and serving the urban poor. Um, Hull House at the time was run by Adams and dozens of other social reformers, most of whom were college-educated women who were essentially inventing the profession of social work. They advocated for voting rights, for juvenile justice, for the eight-hour workday, for public playgrounds and health clinics, and of course they championed access to the arts as central to what it means to be human. So it was with the Hull House players um, in the theater that Monroe found herself working with a cast of over 60 immigrant children and young people on an operetta called A Troll's Holiday, which I recently read. Um, 
Unfortunately, there are no images of a Trolls holiday, so I'm showing you images of other theatrical performances at Hull House. Um, I would absolutely love somebody to do a recreation of a Trolls holiday because it's just so astonishing. Um, it's a story based upon Norwegian myth about the struggles between uh, humans and an underworld of trolls. In Monroe's version, um, a young boy is kidnapped um, by a troll, and his, his older sister sort of fearlessly goes down into the underworld to retrieve her brother. Um, and it's a really treacherous place. She's trapped and nearly forced to marry the Prince of Trolls, but she narrowly escapes back to Earth with her brother. And her experience gives her the confidence to basically forswear men in marriage, which she proclaims in, a, in this jubilant song at the end of the performance. And you just think, this is coming from Harriet Moreau. This is so great. Uh, I'll just read you four lines from the song um, of this, this main character in A Troll's Holiday. She sings, oh, what need of a man. Oh, what need of a wife. I shall live in content the most rapturous life. Um, so maybe these are the best four lines of poetry Monroe ever wrote. Um, how striking to think that she wrote them at Hull House, where the set, the costumes, and the music were, were entirely produced by women who made Hull House one of the most groundbreaking venues for theater and performance. Um, I will also say during this period, she was writing really incredible art reviews. Um, and um, I've learned this from Mark Polad, who we have with us uh, this evening, um, who is an art historian, who's read all of these reviews and written about them for the website, um, that these pieces are really some of uh, Monroe's finest writing. Um, maybe the most fascinating reviews that I've read of Monroe's are the ones that she wrote in response to the Armory Show, the infamous 1913 Armory Show, which was really a, a, an exhibition of explosive and radical works by the European and American avant-garde. You know, artists who are really well known to us today, um, uh, but who were new and provocative at the time, including Cezanne, Gauguin, and work by Fo the Fauves and the, and the Cubists. Um, the show, of course, started in New York and then came here to Chicago, where the crowds were massive at the Art Institute. Double the number of visitors came through the Chicago iteration of the Armory Show. Um, the attendance on free days, just to give you an example, was 15,000 people a day through the show. Um, you can see them coming in and out of the museum here. Of course, many people hated the show, including the students at the Art Institute of Chicago, which had a rather conservative curriculum. Um, and here you see them burning an effigy of, of, of Matisse, who was one of the most you know, derided artists of the show. Um, and then I'm also showing you an image see how it's reproduced, of Duchamp, Marcel Duchamp's new Descending a Staircase, which was by far the most controversial work in the show. Um, it was also the thing that brought people in. There were just packs of people surrounding it. Um, so to read Monroe's um, reviews of the show, she wrote, I want to say, like 13 reviews of the Armory show. She started in New York and then traced it, wrote about it in Chicago, was to see her evolution, the evolution of her thinking. At first, she's resistant to the show. Um, and, and she writes, um, she sort of writes her way into it. You see her kind of evolving towards the modern, coming towards an understanding of the show's great aesthetic and indeed political importance. Just, you know, take for instance Duchamp. Um, to depict a female nude as mechanical, to show her upright, active, walking downstairs like a powerful machine, not an elegant woman in quiet and passive repose. This was radical rethinking, as much about style as it was about freedom and mobility. And this embrace of the modern, of course, was a, a big impulse behind Poetry Magazine. Monroe wanted a place for modern poetry in the same way that the Art Institute was a place for uh, visual work in the city or the Chicago Symphony or Orchestra was a place for music. Um, but she needed funding. This was always a key, key question for her. It wasn't going to come from her own resources or family, and she felt strongly about paying poets for their work. So what she ended up doing was going around office buildings in the loop and literally just knocking on the doors of businessmen, real estate magnates, you know, the industrialists of the city, and asking them to just pledge $50 for five years, $50 each of five years. Um, the people she asked were civic boosters, uh, many of them liked the idea of a homegrown Chicago magazine. 
They were people like Charles Swift, who I've chosen as an exemplar of one of the supporters. There he is. Um, he was, of course, of the Swift Meatpacking Company of the Chicago Stockyards. Many members of the Swiss, Swift family, it was a big family, big Chicago family, supported the magazine, um, like many other wealthy, civic-minded Chicagoans. Um, now, she always published the list of supporters at the back of the magazine and then had this quotation from um, Whitman above it, to have great poets, there must be great audiences too, suggesting that they too were an audience for poetry. Um, but I flag Swift in particular because his, advan uh, his family eventually set up the fund um, down at the University of Chicago that would support the establishment of the magazine's archives. So the legacy is really key. Now, who knows if they ever actually read any of the poetry in the magazine? Um, because keep in mind, Monroe published a scathing critique of the raw, exploitive capitalism of these pork packers, as they were called, when she published Carl Sandburg's Chicago Poems in 1916. There it is. Um, this poem exploded. Uh, it was very scandalous. Um, it opens with these very famous lines, hog butcher for the world, tool maker, stacker of wheat, player with railroads and the nation's freight handler, stormy, husky, brawling, city of the big shoulders. So these are perhaps the most famous lines associated with the city of Chicago. I've been particularly charmed by the kind of structural irony of the publication of the poem, the fact that it appeared in a magazine supported by very well-known pork packers, um, and yet Sandberg was exposing the violence and brutality and exploitation of Chicago through the metaphor of city as stockyard. Um, now, one of the reasons Monroe was also so great as an editor is that she knew how to inhabit both worlds, a world of wildly experimental modernist poetry and the world of Chicago industrialists who wanted their city to be a cultural center. She also played a strong hand in working with some really thorny poets, like Ezra Pound, the American poet living abroad who volunteered to be her foreign correspondent who wrote to her, I see ne nearly everyone who matters. That's literally his first letter to her. Uh, these are drafts of a poem called In a Station of the Metro. Um, and then uh, an image of how it first appeared in the magazine. It looks very different in, in later anthologies of the poem. Um, and that's because Monroe decided to recreate the distinctive typography of the poem, the spaces between phrases in a station of the metro, the apparition of these faces in the crowd, petals on a wet black bough. She kept pounds, phrases spaced apart, which replicates the disjunctions of modern life, especially urban life and its forms of transportation, like the Paris metro, which is where Pound experienced this ghost-like vision of beautiful individuals who compose a crowded city passageway. Now, another reason why Monroe's editorial hand in this poem is so striking historically is that she was deeply influenced by her time in the Far East, especially in Japan and China, where she traveled multiple times, because that's where her younger sister, Lucy Calhoun, lived. And there are two people in this room who know a lot about Lucy Calhoun. Thank you. Um, I've learned from those people uh, about exactly what Lucy Calhoun was doing in, in uh, China and Monroe's visits to see her sister. Um, she published, Monroe would end up um, publishing the work of many imagist po poets. Um, imagism is a, a, a kind of movement in poetry by Anglo-American poets associated with lyrical precision, um, with visual immediate, immediacy, and really inspired by Japanese and Chinese verse. Um, but maybe what's lesser known is that um, Monroe, um, the magazine itself, um, published the work of Chinese poets. So the influence kind of went both ways. I'll go back to that earlier slide. Um, she really hasn't been given the credit for fostering the work of Chinese poets. She published translations of classic J Chinese and Japanese poetry and editorials about literature and culture from the Far East. She befriended two really important Chinese poets, Wen Yi Dao and Hu Shi, who came to Chicago in the 1920s and were then part of um, what's called the Crescent Moon Society, which was a group of poets in Shanghai who were first to really experiment in writing in vernacular Chinese. 
Um, I don't know that many um, uh, poets from chi China, but there was one scholar who came to the Newberry a few years ago, who was a short-term scholar, and explained how actually the influence of the magazine as it published Midwestern free verse, verse like Sandberg, made its way um, in this little periodical form to China and really influenced the Crescent in society. So that there's this incredible network between what was happening there and what was happening in Chicago. And she wrote her dissertation about it. Um, so the magazine had a wide circulation and network, despite the fact that its um, print run was quite small. So I, I want to end with, with just two more images of Monroe and some final thoughts. Um, this is her in those Cass Street offices in the first, you know, one of the rooms of uh, the old dilapidated mansion in the 1920s. She's wearing modern workaday dress, no longer those puffed Victorian sleeves. She's sitting at a desk stacked with correspondence and submissions. Behind her, you can just sort of barely glimpse it, is this wicker rocker, this uh, rocking chair that everybody in the office referred to as the poet's chair. Uh, apparently, people would come by and sit in that chair and talk to Monroe in the afternoons. And she learned from them. She was a fierce editor, but she was also a tremendous listener. For a long time, Monroe thought that her greatest achievement was the Columbian Ode, but it really wasn't. She changed her mind about the Ode. She listened to the voices of critique around her. Was her legacy Poetry Magazine, which is published without fail every month since it was launched in 1912? Yes. Uh, but to my mind, her legacy was even more than the institution she founded. Monroe lives in the spaces between these moments and in the ways in which she gradually and certainly evolved over time. She died in 1936 uh, of a cerebral hemorrhage when she was 76 years old. While she was traveling in the high altitudes of Peru, after serving as a delegate at the International Pen Conference, which is an organization then and now that protects writers and freedom of expression. She was really just about to visit the Incan ruins in Cusco um, when she died. Um, and this kind of trip was not unusual for her. She was always a searcher, always evolving, always looking for the peak experience, quite literally, even as she spent most of her days reading submissions at her desk, writing letters, and editing poems. Monroe did not want petty desires and grievances, in her, word, in her words, to get in the way of the most important and deep, deeply felt human experiences. And so I leave you with this really stunning image of Monroe, which I had never seen before, before I think Missy Bradshaw and Eric found it and put it on display in the exhibition, where she's looking directly at us. Um, and then these words from her autobiography. Um, she writes, the mystery is not the greatness of life, but its littleness. That we, so grandly born, so mightily endowed, should grope with blind eyes and bound limbs in the dust and mire of petty desires and grievances, until we can hardly see the blue of the sky or the glory of the seasons, until we can hardly clasp our neighbor's hand or hear his voice. This is the inexplicable mystery. Thank you. So now I'd love to hear your questions and comments. I think we have plenty of time. Eric, come stand yeah, over here. Yeah, come stand yeah, with you. Yeah. Thank you so much for that talk. Is this going to feedback or anything? Okay. So um, one of the questions actually pertains to one question that I wanted to ask you. So I'm going to go ahead and tell my little anecdote and then ask this question. Um, so this week I gave a staff tour of the exhibition and so many people at the foundation don't know these things, right? They don't know everything about Harriet Monroe because we didn't when we uncovered it. And one of the questions was, um, were there men who worked with Harriet Monroe? Um, and I was also very much like, we think about that, like the, the people that were the movers and shakers of the magazine were the women in so many ways. And those women stood up against Ezra Pound, you know, who was very loud. Um, and they, they won, right? There were times when Pound's advice was taken and plenty when it wasn't. And the question that I think is, is relevant to this anecdote 
is, do you think Monroe's choice to feature then unknown poets was due to her being a female in a male dominated literary scene? What's the relationship of her gender to, to those things? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's also just worth saying that after Monroe, there hasn't been a female editor of the magazine. So, yeah. Um, uh, so there were men. There were. Um, uh, it, just sort of looking through the records, I, um, you know, there obviously was Henry Blake Fuller, who was who was pretty. I mean, he was a, he was definitely a, a, a presence at the magazine in the early days. Um, Morton Zobel, who that, who took over the magazine after she died, um, he was in the mix, I want to say, you know, in the 30s for sure. I can't remember the dates. Um, it was definitely a female-centric space, but, you know, like Hull House, there were always men who were part of the mix. But I, I honestly can't remember who, who I mean, there are probably others in the room who know um, who those men were in, say, the teens and 20s, but I'm not sure. And the other question about... Um, the minor poets in relationship to gender is a little weird, right? As if being a woman makes you lesser or something. So then you're sympathized with the lesser. So I'll just throw that out there. But no, I think, I actually don't think it had anything to do with her gender. I think when you publish a monthly magazine, you know, inevitably you're not going to fill it with greatest hits every time. You know, it's really hard to see what, what, you know, will stay, like what it will be lasting, you know, until you have um, some historical distance from it. Um, so, you know, maybe another way, and maybe this is to more accurately kind of think through the question of, of thinking about things is, is, does the open door policy come out of kind of a sense of flexibility, right? I thought about that too, yeah. when you were talking about caregiving, what yes. like caregiving or, or women's work, what that might mean in an editorial policy, right? Some kind of like openness or compassion, which we also talked about in her correspondence with people who submitted to the magazine, if that influenced her editorial perspective in a particular way, maybe it comes out as a, a radical openness. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, um, that's which I think is also, um, you know, if you tie it to being a woman, downplaying the intense radicalism of being open, right? In her art criticism and everything else, she's advocating for work that makes the American person think. She's, she's, she's asking people, readers, to think right. about what they read. Right, because it may actually sound kind of soft, oh, I'm open to everything, right? But it wasn't. It was something that she had to sort of fiercely defend, um, especially from somebody like Pound, you know, who wrote in letters, damn the audience, who cares about the audience, you know? Like, don't try to reach everybody, just do this one thing. Um, you know, he was it, he was referring to the the um, quotation by Whitman to have great poetry. There must be great audiences too. She was really trying to build a readership for poetry as much as well as much as publish the best poetry she could. Mm -hmm. This is related to Pound. So one of the other questions is: Did Harriet Monroe patronize James Joyce? Patronize? Um, she published some of his Joyce, poems. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the kind of starry-eyed, romantic, early poems mm -hmm. of Joyce, although I can't remember actually their titles. Um, I can't remember what she actually said about Joyce. I'm not sure. Do you remember? I don't remember what she said about Joyce so much as how, like, the advocacy for proof rock when T.S. Eliot's proof rock came in. And, of course, Joyce and, and Eliot are being published um, at the same time and um, also being advocated for by Ezra Pound. Um, but I do think in the mix there, right, um, on the prose side of things. Um, this question is, were there other organizations or magazines contemporary to Poetry Magazine in Chicago? What was significant or different about Poetry Magazine in comparison? And, and were there local competitors for Poetry? Yes, the Little Review. Oh. Um, so the Little Review was uh, founded by Margaret Anderson just two years after Poetry Magazine. Uh, Margaret Anderson was a um, really extraordinary uh, person who um, was, uh, you know, as, as committed to publishing um, editorials um, and prose and art. Her, she met Jane Heap a few years after she started the magazine, who was then an art student at the School of the Art Institute, and the magazine had a really intense visual flair. Um, 
they were radicals. They published the work of Emma Goldman and other um, socialists, Marx Marxists, you know, sort of anarchists. Every ism that happened in the early 20th century passed through the Lowell Review. It's an interesting kind of reflection of the times. Um, and Margaret answered, so I, I, I don't, she wasn't a competitor, but she, she, she really actually looked up to Monroe. Uh, but but they were publishing a lot of the same, certainly Midwestern poets. Um, when the Little Review did publish poetry, it had a lot of overlap with Poetry Magazine. The other little magazine worth um, sort of comparing poetry to is the Dial Magazine, which was the more conservative kind of, I'm going to publish only uh, work from England. You know, uh, you know, America doesn't yet have a literary culture, so let's go elsewhere and publish what's real literature. That was the impulse of the dial. Um, and that little magazine was in some ways what both Anderson and Monroe didn't want to do. Um, but there was overlap. There was yeah, overlap. And, yeah. and the dial published The Wasteland, too. So that right, was but, later. But this was that like was later. pound yeah. behind that, too. So yeah. we wanted to like bring that into the room. Yeah. Was like, Eventually, um, the dial did transform when it went east. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when it left Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, this this one just came in, too. Um, so we're going to ask about, about John, the well-born root. Um, in doing research about the World's Fair, um, for my musical, The White City, I saw indications that Monroe was in love with her brother-in-law, John Wellborn Root. She definitely was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So this is her sister's husband. Um, and, you know, you can't read the biography that she wrote of him without just sort of wondering, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's all over that it's just, it's hagiographic, but it's also the man can do no wrong, but there's an interesting connection with the Colombian ode as well. So she writes the Colombian ode and she's mourning root. I mean, her whole family was the city of Chicago was mourning the death of John root. He had died from pneumonia. He, he caught pneumonia as the story goes after a kind of late dinner at the Astor street home where he was helping some people get into a carriage out front. He forgot to put on a coat. It was a really cold night. He caught pneumonia and he died. So it was very tragic and quick and sad. Um, and then, you know, she writes his, his biography. Um, and she actually put him into the Colombian ode as like a figure for Chicago that Chicago mourns. And when, um, the, the poem was vetted by this, um, this commission of all men who were in charge of the opening ceremonies of the fair, and they gave her a really hard time, um, and partly they wanted to get rid of the root stuff. Um, and so then she had to really defend it, and he sort of became a more abstracted figure of loss, um, but he's inside the poem, too, in that way. Um, but yes, I mean, she did have some really strong, passionate relationships in her early years, but he was this kind of both he, he was an intellectual force and influence on her too yeah yeah i was, I was thinking also the the dial editor um conservative dial editor yes. is the one who gave her feedback on oh yeah the ode, right? william morton payne payne mm -hmm. morton something mm -hmm. like that writing right. about lack of euphony in the, in the poem. yes um <laughs> so oh, right. um i think we have we have a little bit of time left and, and we're out of um uh, the queue of questions so we'll go to one that I know. I want, I want to ask the people in the room who don't oh, necessarily know how to oh. text or whatever. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Is that possible? Can we pass back a yeah, microphone? I can. Or I can bring the microphone over yeah. here. Awesome. Hi. That was fascinating and amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I was also right before your lecture at the Seeing Race exhibition down the hall, and I wanted to ask you just from your perspective as a former staffer or whatever at the Newberry, um, when we um, talk about Harriet Monroe's legacy vis-a-vis -vis, like contemporary literature, um, the race of all of those modern poets what is uh, kind of what's often uh, charged or problematized in modernist studies. And I just wonder about like after that exhibition like and this conversation about care work how we kind of 
is gender diversity the same way that race is diversity? Thank you. Yeah, that's a hard question. It's a good question. Um, I love that you're thinking both about that exhibition, you know, and then sort of jumping into the modern, right? Early modern and modern um, and trying, and, you know, finding those continuities. Um, you know, I think, you know, it, uh, you know, intersectional feminism, you know, is, is kind of where we are, you know, you think about it together, I don't know how that you unwind those classifications, you know, we're, we're informed by so many different forces, and it'd be hard to say, well, this is the gender part of me, or this is the race, or, um, or that I'm going to understand, uh, you know, history through just one of those um, categories. Um, so I, I don't, I don't know how to untie that. Um, I think you're totally right that when we look at the work that Monroe published, um, or maybe, you know, when we think about the, the poems that were published in the magazine that we still kind of um, remember, you know, the really canonical ones, um, it, is, it is really white, uh, no question. Um, and so that is w one of the reasons I think it's really worth pursuing how she engaged with uh, the work of Chinese poets is I think it kind of um, shows sh shows a, a wider breadth of, of the magazine um, uh, to be sure and and range and influence and impact that it had. You know, by the 30s, the the, the magazine was definitely publishing the work of African American poets. Um, Gwendolyn Brooks, I mean, her you know when she first gets a moment in the magazine, she's like this. She called the magazine the goal. I mean, that was the goal, you know, and she did publish there, um, as did, did many um, uh, African-American writers, both in Chicago and beyond. But mostly, maybe exception with the Langston, ex for the exception of like Langston Hughes, that comes after Monroe. Yeah, thanks for your question. I think that's all the questions we have time Thank for. Thank you all for being here and for everybody online. Yeah.